Okay, folks, sorry about being a little bit late. Um, had some transport issues. Uh, the tram left three minutes before it was supposed to. I was about two minutes too late. Um, join Slido. Again, if you have any questions and the like, this set up. Yes, the midterm opens on Friday, um, and you have until next Friday at 1,800 hours to undertake it. We 21 questions, 19 of which are, you know, multiple choice, multiple answer, true, false, ordering, matching pictures, whatever, uh, and then two of which are numerics that are very simple, straightforward applications of the equations you've got to have in either the atmosphere, flight mechanics, or orbital mechanics. Today, those two questions are the last two questions. So you all get them in a random order. You'll do 19 of the first step, set, and then you'll get the last two questions which is an improvement over last year where they were all randomized and some people got the numeric questions first, um, which was a bit of a disconcerting thing because you have what is in some ways harder that you have to do some work and enter a number, uh, in some ways probably a little bit more up your alley, but it did throw some people off. Okay, so 41 of you have so far answered. Do spacecraft experience drag, true, false, spacecraft experience drag. Um, okay. So 85% of you said true, 15% said false. Now we're thinking of this in, that, in the science versus engineering sense. And absolutely, true is the correct answer here. Um, no matter where your spacecraft is, there are particles. Even in interstellar space, there is a galactic wind. Now, is it meaningful drag? That's the engineering question we have. And like everything else we do, that's the first step. What's the order compared to everything else? If I'm traveling at relatively slow velocities, 50,000 kilometers per hour, far away from Earth, it's probably not meaningful. If I am traveling at 90% the speed of light, it definitely is going to be meaningful. Right? You'll say, we have never done that for any particle or any vehicle at any time. <coughs> if I am the International Space Station, it is absolutely essential. Drag affects that orbit, the International Space Station, substantially. So we have to plan to boost it, otherwise it'll deorbit and the like. If we're doing a satellite in very low Earth orbit, it becomes even more critical. And for some of those concepts, we have active constant propulsion to maintain orbit. We need that. However, for the rest of this topic, it doesn't matter. We are not going to consider drag in orbit. Okay. Those of you who watch the videos know why I like this photo. It's a great photo where we see Earth in the distance. We have the lunar excursion module, which is a fascinating vehicle in its own. Um, this is probably the first manned aerospace vehicle that could not have flown without the assistance of a computer. There is no way the pilots on board could have totally hand flown this vehicle. Just not possible. That is compared to the Apollo Command Module, Soyuz, Gemini, Mercury, and the like, which were all 
basically flyable. In fact, in the case of Gemini and Mercury, they were flyable. They were literally cable controlled. You would pull a thing and pull a cable that would actuate a, a valve that would open a, and cause a thruster to fire. But this was the first vehicle that was computer controlled where you gave the computer your intent, what you wanted it to do, and it would figure out how to do it and then fire the thrusters appropriately. And it was also the first use of integrated circuits in a operational computer. The Apollo guidance computer, which was actually both on the LEM and on the command module, is a pretty fascinating thing. It uses magnetic core memory. It's all these weird things at the time, but it was pretty much bleeding edge. And it was because this required to be so light. The skin was so thin that if you poked at it hard, you would have punched through it. Um, it was, I believe, because the US, they use thousands of inches. It's actually in one over 1 28ths of an inch. Um, Six thousandths of an inch. Uh, you can do your conversion to millimeters if you want, um, but it's very, very thin. Basically, the thickness of a soda can. They're thinner now. Um, but it's just a fascinating thing. The thing about this is this required extremely complex orbital calculations. We had to get into orbit, do the translunar injection, which was an escape orbit or escape fire, do a mid-course correction, capture, de-escape on the moon, orbit the moon, and then descend and do a powered controlled descent to landing. So think about it. We have Falcon 9 first stages that descend and do a vertical landing. This is the pioneer of that. Yes, it was a low gravity environment. But all of those techniques and controls were essential, and you have no drag, no atmosphere to help stabilize your vehicle. That's what those grid fins are for. They help stabilize the vehicle. If the atmosphere's not there, the problem becomes a lot harder. OK, I'm going to open up a survey now um, as we get in deeper. Um, but, but just before that, we'll go through the definitions. <coughs> like everything. You need to understand these terms. Specifically, we'll be asking you about things like gravitational parameter. It's the size of gravity well, GM, or G big M for uh, when you're in a planet. Um, things like impulse burn. There is no thruster out there that gives you a true impulse burn. I don't know if you saw, but the Orion Artemis mission is supposed to launch in February. Consider a pseudo impulse burn. Lasts for 30 minutes. Impulse would be instantaneous. But 30 minutes compared to burning the whole two days of transit, that's pretty close to impulse. Um, <coughs> for today, the big ones are apoapsis and periapsis and eccentricity because they describe our orbits around a body or leaving a body. That's an interesting one. They're not the same. And we'll talk about these later, vernal equinox, true anomaly, semi-major axis, and the ecliptic later in the semester when we talk about the rocket equation and a little bit more detail on orbital things. OK? So let's start that next for you. Nope, that's not right. Do the orbit survey. Anybody got a piece of paper they want to crumple up? For me. You don't have to. 
while we're doing this. Because one of the questions, is a suborbital rocket considered on an orbit? Here, throw that. Anybody willing to catch it? By the way, a ballistic trajectory, that's an orbit. It just happens to intersect the Earth. So we don't consider it orbital in the sense it doesn't sustain itself. But an ICBM, we didn't worry about the atmospheric drag, and the Earth became vacant, no density, it would continue to orbit. So it is a closed orbit. It just happens to intersect the ground somewhere else. That's what suborbital flights are all about. They do not have the altitude and the velocity to maintain clearance of Earth's atmosphere or Earth's surface. I see the camera is pointed very helpfully right over here. So if you're watching, this is what you're going to get today. Don't know why. Okay, so the first question, para-Aryan represents what? Now, this is a bit of a trick, so it's can you figure out what Aryan means? What's peri in an orbit? So periapsis versus apoapsis, yeah. Furthest point or the nearest point? Are you sure? Okay. Anybody agree with that? Anybody disagree with that? Hey, being wrong is good. Being right is sometimes good. Remember back to our definitions. I get to them. Periapsis, the point in the orbit closest to the primary body. So, sorry, using that helps if I go to the right place. Using that, we're looking for the closest point. Anybody know what Arian refers to in this sense? Yeah. Yes. So, of course, in classic orbit stuff, in space stuff, um, we use the planets come from the Roman gods, but we use the Greek gods that are roughly equivalent for the names of things relating to it. So Jupiter, when we talk about the moons of Jupiter, that's the Jovian system. In the case of Mars, we use Arian. Anybody know what Neptune would be? Or Venus. Oh, I always forget Venus. So, it's not a generic orbit. That's going to be that one right there. So, it's the nearest point about Mars. But the key thing here isn't that it's Mars or not Mars. That's really more for if you're seeing something and you go, well, Perry, that's the closest point in the orbit. And then that, ooh, what body am I orbiting? Because they'll have that name if you're orbiting Enceladus around Jupiter. The moon, something like that. Perihelion, what's that the closest point to in an orbit? Helios was the god of? Yeah, the sun. So perihelion, you hear about that for any orbit that you know, they go around the sun for some reason directly. Um, you'll see that a lot, especially for a solar observat observatory. Okay. So, closed orbits have which type of specific energy? Now, this is a bit more of a, a mess. That epsilon up here, mu over 2a, that's the specific energy of an orbit. This is an elliptical orbit. Circular orbit is just a subset of that. 
by definition, if my specific energy is less than zero, I am fixed around this body. So it's a closed orbit. So they are less than zero. They are negative. Anybody know what orbit has a strictly zero? Specific energy. Is it going to be closed? So what are our orbit types? We have circular, elliptical. What are the other two? Parabolic and hyperbolic. So it's probably going to be one of those other two because they're not closed, right? What's the eccentricity of a parabolic orbit? Anybody remember? One. Parabolic orbit is that nice first escape orbit. <coughs> that first one you see there. It's the one with a specific energy that is strictly zero. So the correct answer is for an orbit with an eccentricity of one, which is true, it is a parabola. It has a specific energy of zero. It is our first, our lowest energy escape orbit. This is the least amount of energy we have to put into a system to say bye-bye to whatever body we were orbiting. It is, as they all are, conic sections. We all remember what the definition of a conic section is, right? Just taking a cone, cutting a plane through it, starting at zero inclination, inclining that plane, it goes from circular elliptical, once it breaks free, parabola, and then hyperbola. <coughs> Why would we want to do a hyperbolic orbit? Either hyperbolic departure or hyperbolic arrival. Why might we want to do that? Because we're putting more energy than we strictly need to to escape. What might be... Why might we want to do it? Yeah. Turn around? Yeah. Slingshot maneuver? Anybody else? I mean, all of those things may give us a hyperbolic orbit, or we may need to to do that maneuver. But the main reason is time. The more energy we put into something, the faster we'll get to wherever we're going. So if we do a hyperbolic departure from Earth onto Mars, we'll get to Mars faster. Conversely, we're probably going to arrive at that case hyperbolically. <coughs> now, we can take energy out, do a parking orbit, or we can do something crazy. We can arrive direct entry into the atmosphere hyperbolically. Only an idiot would do that, right? We've done it. Apollo did it. Apollo 13 was a hyperbolic entry. Really high energy entry. But it wasn't the highest energy entry, believe it or not. That was Apollo... Was it 8? First one coming back from the moon. It is slingshot around the moon. Without the LEM. Hyperbolic reentry. Really high energy reentry. People said that was stupid. They did it. People say lots of things are stupid, and then we do it. Might not be the smartest thing to do most of the time. But yeah, we would do a hyperbola, hyperbola just to get there faster. And when you talk about manned missions to Mars, it's all about speed. Because between here and Mars, you are at the whims of the sun. Human beings and solar and cosmic radiation don't go well together. So we want to minimize transit time, all else remaining. Okay, so relatively straightforward, we have our ellipse, then we have our generic orbits. 
Anybody remember what an orbit greater inclination greater than 90 degrees is called? Anybody remember what one less than 90 degrees is called? Less than 90 degrees is prograde. That means we are orbiting in the same direction as the rotation of the body. It's greater than 90 degrees. We're now orbiting opposite direction in some manner. So that's retrograde, which means we don't have any of the advantage of that rotational velocity on launch. Because if I'm sitting at the equator, I'm already moving. If I jump, I have that velocity. Leave the atmosphere, I have that. I don't need to add that velocity in. If I go retrograde, go backwards, I have to add that in. <coughs> okay. Let's answer some questions. Off. Do -do -do. That's not a question, by the way. That's a plea. I see only six of you have upvoted that. So the rest of you, you want to be tortured, right? I'm not sure what you define as... Oh, oh there we go. Keep, come on, come on, come on. <coughs> come on. This isn't meant to torture you. I mean, I do cultivate a reputation. Um, no, I, the main reason that you have such hard time constraints on this, it is met, because it is open notes, open book, open internet. There isn't any controls on what you're doing. So if I give you unlimited time, it would be a trivial exercise. The other reason to do this, completely separate, um, is that this is, these quizzes are, relatively speaking, inconsequential, right? You miss one of these quizzes, it's 15%, 20% of this module. This module is 1 12th, so roughly 8.667% of this year, which is roughly 1 10th or less. 6.7%. What is that? What is that? What's 6.7%? Roughly. What's that fraction? 1 15th? So 1 10th to 1 15th of your degree program? Any one of these assessments is only really consequential within this unit. So there's no one question that's going to make or break anything. Um, and when you realize that, if you don't know, you don't know. Uh, someone did ask me last week, I honestly don't remember who it was, so I can't, even if I wanted to embarrass them, can't embarrass them. Um, they said, what happens if we don't know the answer? What do you do? What you do is don't click any buttons, just click next. And I think that may have confused some people before. Because um, there isn't an obvious way to select nothing. Um, and that's really important with negative marking. Because you don't know anything and you just guess randomly. If there isn't negative marking, and there are five options on each one, what are you going to get on the quiz? What's your expected percentage? If I guess randomly, one of it's correct out of five, and there's 10 or 100 or 1,000 questions, what's the expected outcome? You get one fifth, right. It's going to be a 20%. Okay. That's not too bad. That's pretty shit. Um, now I can go, well, wait a minute. Dr. Hollingsworth always puts something absurd as one of the question answers which isn't always true, but I do occasionally. Surprising number of people select the absurd one. So now I've got four. I'm going to guess amongst. Well, now that's 25%. Okay. Still not very good. 
I, I can narrow down two. I've got three, I'm guessing, between on average. Now I've passed. Don't know actually the answer, but I've passed. Or I've at least not had to reset it. So that's why there's negative marking. <coughs> and of course, if you've got multiple answers that you can select, select all the correct ones, kind of like that last one we had, um, without, uh, you just tick them all and you get full credit. Um, so that's, it is not meant to torture you. Um, that's the final exam, by the way. There's always a question that is meant to exercise your mind and test your deep depth of your understanding. It is not meant to make you suffer by any stretch of the imagination. But the fact that you don't get it right isn't surprising in many cases. Some of you will, a lot of you won't. The real question is, how did you go about it? And there's plenty of partial credit in those. They tend to be towards the end of the exam. Um, OK, how long is the test? Oh, that's a good question. Just looked at it last week. 22 questions. Is it 20 minutes? I think it's 20 minutes. So it's not long. OK, which week is the midterm content up to? This week. So there is stuff on orbital mechanics. So things like, what's the lowest energy? Open orbit might be a question. Everybody remember what that was? Which one has the specific energy strictly zero? If you just achieve escape velocity, what orbit are you on? What type of orbit? It's open. You're escaping. Not a fast one. Therefore, it is parabolic. OK? <coughs> are we supposed to know? Great. Are we supposed to know Greek mythology for the next No. No. I'll do it in these lectures, things like that, where it doesn't matter. I do not expect you to know Greek mythology. Um, do not expect you to know Greek mythology. Um, but I don't actually expect you to know the etymology of most of these words. It is nice for at the atmosphere, to know that tropos comes from the Greek for mixing, stratos comes from the Greek for layered, because it tells you a lot about those layers of the atmosphere. But I don't know, I expect you, if I say, what is the Greek for mixing? I say tropos. I don't expect that. Okay? Um, So this week, you do not need to know Greek mythology. When is the exam? Ooh, don't know. Which would be sometime in the week commencing the 17th or the week commencing the 24th of January. Um, we will find out. What's the best way to revise for the midterm? Um, like, this is actually a really good question. The best way to revise, as is always, is to go through and condense your notes. Start from your full notes that you've written or not written, and write them down, try to condense them. And ideally, keep doing it till you get down to one side of a page of A4, because that's actually what you want. And hopefully, even less than that. Because in reality, it's not the piece of paper that's important. It's what you process by doing it. Um, I would go back after condensing all of that, go back to the practice quiz, forgetting all the questions about the systems content. So you'll know right away you haven't seen any of that material. Um, use that, see if that works, um, and the like. OK? Yes, as we said, it has negative marking. Ah, here's a great question. 
Why can launchers like SpaceX recover a capsule, i.e. Dragon and Crew Dragon, but not the second stage, the upper stages? So the beauty of our first stage is while it gives us a lot of altitude, gets us up out of the atmosphere and out of the gravity well, it's not going very fast at the end of burnout. However, that second stage, which gives us most of our delta V in the end, puts us into orbit, that's now going extremely fast. The reason we don't recover second stages is we've got to take all of that energy back. Now, we can do that by saving a bunch of fuel and slowing down, basically undoing what we did, or we can do what we do with capsules and entry vehicles. We use atmospheric drag to slow us down. Now, drag scales with the square of velocity. It means if I double the speed, the drag goes up by a factor of four. Unfortunately, something else does worse. Heat flux, energy, scales with the cube of velocity. So if I double the speed, that heat flux goes up by a factor of that energy, that kinetic energy. So I've got eight times the energy to take out. If I go even faster and faster and faster, that's a lot of energy. I'm going to make matters even worse. Our capsules, the entry face, tends to be blunt. Edges of a stage tend to be relatively sharp. The actual heat load on a point goes up in many cases with the power of seven. Anybody know what two to the seventh is? Two to the eighth is 256. So seventh will be half that 128. So if I doubled the speed, that heat flux on that point, that was 128 times. That's why we don't like pointy things going particularly fast. And I mean particularly fast, more than about Mach 3. Okay? So that's why it becomes really, really expensive uh, to capture those upper stages. The only reason we recover capsules is because we want what's inside. Be that sample returns or human beings. It's generally considered poor to dispose of your humans on return, um, or at least plan to. Uh, I will do some problem sets for you to put up on for this, especially last week. Last week's the killer of stuff. Um, at least that are appropriate for the types of questions you'll have to answer for the midterm, and then we'll do more detailed ones later. Yeah. Uh, that is very true. The midterm opens this Friday and finishes a week later, 1,800 hours. Okay. Our next poll or survey. <coughs> this one's about changing orbits. This is the fun one. This is the one you may get a question on. I mean, fair questions here. I give you the mass of the body you're orbiting. I give you the radius of the orbit. G, Newton's cons, gravitational constant. I ask you what the energy of that orbit is based on the orbit information I give you. Or maybe I give you a spacecraft and an orbit and a current velocity. And I ask you about same thing, and I ask you, what's the escape velocity for said orbit? Or what's the delta V required to escape? Because if I already gave you a velocity, you just subtract that from the escape velocity. Those are the types of questions, relatively straightforward use of these equations. Or maybe I ask you, what's the delta V to change the inclination in this condition? By 10 degrees, or 50 degrees, or whatever it is.
apoapsis, combined burns where appropriate, 48%, burn prograde, burn at the periapsis, burn retrograde. So the correct answers are, um, actually, it should also have burn prograde. Um, it doesn't really matter in a sense, but burn at the apoapsis. You want to burn at the lowest velocity. Your lowest velocity of your orbit is your apoapsis. If you're going to change your periapsis at the same time, combine that. Obviously, depending what you're doing, you may turn, you may burn pro or retrograde. Um, burning at the periapsis, you don't generally want to do um, for inclination change. Unless, of course, you're trying to get down at the same time. Okay? Um, what factors affect the delta V required to achieve escape? And the radius of your orbit, the depth of your gravity well, the current velocity of the spacecraft, and obviously the direction of the burn. Um, in reality, we're always going to assume, unless I tell you otherwise, if you're trying to achieve escape, you're going to burn pro, and ideally as pro as possible. But if you're doing an escape with an inclination change, which may make a lot of sense if you're trying to go to, um, trying to get to an orbit that's on a different plane than the ecliptic, on a different planet, um, you may do that. But that will change your delta V, because of course you're also changing the inclination. Okay. And then finally, to raise your periapsis, what type of burn should you undertake? Prograde at the apso apoapsis, prograde at the periapsis, retrograde, or retrograde. Okay, we're raising, so we want to go with our orbit. So burn along the direction we're, burnt, we're traveling. Um, and then the thing is, in the simplest sense of orbital mechanics, if you want to raise or lower one, your peri or your apo, you burn at the other. So to raise your periapsis, burn, or lower your periapsis, you burn at your apoapsis. To raise or lower your apoapsis, you burn at your periapsis. So that means if we want to go to an escape velocity, the best energy point to do it is at our periapsis because we're opening up our apoapsis. So that first one, prograde. Okay, uh, let's do some quick, if there are any questions left. Uh, what is happening on Monday next week? Uh, that is your systems activity. I will be sending you an email on getting in groups based on your time slot. Uh, whether you're at one or at two, I think it is. There's in the computer cluster. Uh, groups of three or four, ideally four, but some of you will be in groups of three. Um, and then what we do for the next few weeks. Uh, are all the questions all about orbits in this week's material? Yeah, uh, nothing that we have later in the semester will uh, come on this midterm. Um, I don't see a lecture plan for next week. Uh, so does it mean there is no lecture next week? Nope. The idea is that you are revising and consolidating information to do the midterm, or have taken the midterm, so you're not, not doing it. Um, are there practice questions for the midterm? Yeah, on the practice test. About a third of the questions are appropriate for the midterm. Uh, will all the polls we have help with the midterm test? Uh, maybe. Uh, I will put the questions up for you um, that we've done throughout all of these and, and the like. Okay. Thank you very much. See you on Monday. <laughs>